Welcome everyone. What a joy and delight it is to see you and to have you all join us, whether you're joining us on Zoom or on YouTube Live or perhaps are watching a recording of this service at some other point during the week. We're so glad that you're here. We want you to know that no matter who you are and no matter where you happen to be on your journey, you are very welcome. Indeed, uh, there's something we love to do whenever we gather for worship, and that is to affirm God's goodness. So I invite those who are able, um, who are joining us on Zoom, to unmute themselves as we together affirm God's goodness. God is good! All, All the time. time! All the time! God, God is, is good! good. Okay, because we can't say it too many times, and I want to hear even more enthusiasm. God is good. All, all the time. The time. Woo all the time. God, God is good. Is good. good. Amen and amen. That's fantastic. All right. Now, another thing we love to do when we gather to worship, especially if we are um, worshiping online, uh, and even if we're going to, when we're back in the sanctuary, we'll still do this, and that is to light a candle to remind us of how the light of God's presence and the light of God's love for us shines brightly among us, no matter where we happen to be. So let us light our candles now. And now I'm going to have um, uh, Deacon Marilyn is going to take the part of the leader um, from uh, uh, for our call to worship and Sue is going to take the part of the people but I invite all of you uh, to join in uh, with uh, Marilyn and Sue. Let's go to the... hold on... Come, you who are hungry for good things. We long for spiritual food to nourish our empty places. Come, you who feel restless with worry or longing. We come to be rooted and grounded in God's love. Come, you who feel scattered or fragmented by too many concerns. Jesus is with us, gathering up the pieces of our lives and making us whole. Come and be filled with the fullness of God. Let us worship God. 
Our opening hymn is Come and Fill, and you'll see there's two verses here. We're going to sing it through, verse 1, verse 2, and then we'll repeat verse 1 and verse 2. to join with me in our unison prayer of confession. God of grace, you would satisfy our hungry hearts with nourishment that lasts. Yet we often try to fill the gnawing ache inside of us with all sorts of things that only leave us empty. We struggle to trust you to create blessing where we least expect it. We can get stuck in a sense of scarcity, feeling like there's never enough and more is always better. So we eat the bread of anxiety, buy more than we need, and waste or throw away what we could share. Our habits of consumption are polluting your creation and causing harm to all our neighbors. Forgive us, loving God. Help us to trust that we are enough and we have enough to thrive and flourish. Fill us to overflowing with love, joy, and peace. Beloved people of God, hear this wonderful good news. God's compassion and forgiveness is as lavish as a heavily laden banquet table. Indeed, God feeds us in ways that nourish all our empty places, giving us strength for the challenges we face, peace that heals, and the wisdom to turn in a new direction. God satisfies our deepest yearnings and provides more than enough for us to share. So eat your fill of the rich food of God's love. And the people say, thanks be to God, amen. Our first lesson this morning um, 
comes from the letter to the Ephesian uh, Christian community or proto-Christian community, as you may have it, um, the community in Ephesus. And uh, we're going to be hearing from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And the voices of Paul are Reverend Chris B., Marilyn S., and Mary J. I pray that according to the riches of God's glory, God may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to God, who by the power of work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. In God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. And now we move to the Gospel according to John. We've been in the Gospel according to Mark um, because we are in uh, the year of the lectionary cycle that focuses primarily on Mark's Gospel. But Mark's Gospel is pretty darn short. It's uh, the shortest of the four. And as a result, uh, from time to time, we will get passages from John's Gospel because the lectionary cycle is three years and focuses on Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John gets interspersed amongst those three years, but we seem to get a, a lot of John, especially in the year that we're on Mark's gospel. So we're going to be hearing a very familiar uh, story of a large crowd of people being filled with food, uh, despite everybody's expectations that there wouldn't be enough. And this, this story of the feeding of the 5,000 is actually found in all four Gospels. But Mark's, excuse me, John's telling has something really unique in that there is a, a boy who has something that he's willing to share in this story. So we're going to be hearing from John chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. I am Jesus. Mary B. and Marilyn S. are the people. Reverend Chris B. is Philip, and Mary J. is Andrew. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. I don't think we heard you, Mary. Uh, speak loudly and close to the mic. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Thank you. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for Jesus himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves 
And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied. Jesus told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up. And from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who was to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, got into a boat, and started across the lake to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The lake became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the lake and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the land towards which they were going. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. All right. And our hymn of preparation we'll have in just a moment here see here is we cannot own the sunlit sky i invite you to join in singing along with this hymn this week, a UCC uh, clergy colleague of mine, Reverend Emily Heath, shared with their congregation back in 2014. While attending college and seminary in Atlanta, Reverend Emily became aware of two churches of the same denomination located on opposite ends of town. 
one church was very small, with only about 35 active members. And it was located in a neighborhood that for years had been down and out. The other was the largest church in the denomination, not just in the city, but in the country. And on Sundays, in one of the most affluent neighborhoods in Atlanta, thousands of people stream through its doors to worship. Reverend Emily in her story affirmed that both churches did some amazing things and touched many lives in their ministries. But the little church, with only about 35 members, did something amazing every night. They invited homeless men in from the streets and let them sleep in cots in their sanctuary. They fed them hot meals. They helped them secure housing and health care. They walked with them on their journey. Apparently, the pastor of the larger church occasionally used to invite the pastor of the smaller church to speak in worship at the larger church. And the big church pastor was, according to Reverend Emily, a faithful Christian man who inspired great things, but who always struggled with the fact that his church never seemed to think that they had enough to do more. Despite thousands of members and millions of dollars, there was always this sense of scarcity and not abundance. And so, when the small church pastor would come and tell the congregation about their ministry, the big church pastor would then slip in this fact, hoping his congregation might hear it. You know, he said, this little church manages to do all this ministry every year on a budget that is less than our own church's electricity bill. Of course, the experiences of these two churches that Reverend Emily described in their story are not unique to a particular denomination or a particular place. Congregations can have plenty of resources, whether that's bulging membership roles, a well-funded budget, lots of willing and able ministry volunteers, well-equipped and energy-efficient buildings, or anything else. They can have plenty and still feel like there's not enough. Their decisions and their self-perception can be dominated by a fear of scarcity. And congregations can seem to fail every traditional outside metric of success. Be small in number, have an aging building with deferred maintenance, bare bones budget that might still result in a deficit. And yet those congregations can trust in God's provision their decisions, their self-understanding is shaped by the belief that there will be enough. Which brings us to our story today about the feeding of the 5,000, which I always love how they make a point of saying it's the feeding of 5,000 men and that there were women and children there too. And interestingly enough, the catalyst for all of this was one of those children. But what happens is that there's this crowd that's been following Jesus. Jesus doesn't seek out a crowd. It's the, the crowd of people. So many people are hearing about what his ministry is about, how it is a manifestation of healing and wholeness, of, of uh, regenerating connection among people, of having a sense of hope about the future, of, of being able to experience blessing and joy in the presence of someone who seems to, to somehow channel God's energy and joy and delight through him. This crowd shows up and they want to hear what Jesus has to say and, 
and after teaching and after being with them and preaching and he realizes they have a need. They're hungry. And why wouldn't they be? Because I imagine, as we know so many of the people that Jesus ministered to in his day and age, were people who were living on the edge financially, who it was all they could do to have even one meal a day of barley bread, which was considered, of course, much, much more the food of the poor than the wheat bread that would be the food of the rich. And why were they so poor? Well, because in many cases, the land that they had been farming for years was um, they were forced off of so that large landowners could consolidate that farming land and, and produce food to support the wider Roman Empire, not to feed the people who were hungry right there. And so Jesus sees that these folks are likely very hungry because chances are they're just making it barely from one day to the next. So he determines that there's something that his disciples can do about this. But when he asks them a question that's kind of designed to reveal where their minds are set, it becomes really evident that Philip, his response is coming from a scarcity mindset. He tells Jesus, listen, not even six months wages. We don't, we don't have enough money to feed such a huge crowd. Now the disciple Andrew, he, he at least notices what's present, a boy's lunch. But he too regards the two fish and five barley loaves as not being enough to make a difference. What Jesus sees is a young person who recognizes a need and who is willing to share what he has, even if that seems so small in light of such a large, hungry crowd. It's that kid's act of sharing, of trusting that what he has, no matter how small it is, can make a difference that becomes the catalyst for a real miracle. How often do we ourselves get stuck in a scarcity mindset? How many possibilities for ministry have we objected to or refused to even consider? Because we're convinced we just don't have enough. We don't have enough money to pay our bills if we were to open our doors to the wider community without receiving some sort of compensation, some some sort of rental income. We have a few people who might be willing to volunteer. We think, but ah, not enough to keep this new opportunity for ministry going. When we're certain that there's not enough time, not enough energy, not enough funds, not enough interest on the part of other people, not enough commitment to do a thing, we can't even make room to consider it. When we're caught in a fear of scarcity, we can't muster the curiosity to imagine how something might come to be. What's more, we may not even be able to realize and recognize the resources we actually do have. Well, I'd like to say that we're, as a congregation, hopefully somewhere between those two example churches in the story at the beginning of my sermon, that there are times when we get stuck in a fear of scarcity, and there are other times when we say, hey, hey, we do have a resource here that could make a difference. And when there are times when we're willing to step forward in faith and trust that whatever the small thing is, it will be enough. And in fact, God can take that and make something truly remarkable. Two examples. One is, as we've been talking about during the announcement time for several Sundays now, our willingness to participate in the faith-based court access program. 
What does that require of us? It requires a few volunteers to serve as hosts, to help someone who might be in need of accessing some technology that would be provided to us, a laptop computer, a printer scanner, uh, and somebody to sort of orient that individual who may be experiencing domestic violence at home and need to have a, a private confidential place where they can connect, whether it's with domestic violence counseling or, or whether it's uh, with, with an attorney or with someone else with legal, legal expertise that might offer pro bono um, some services, whether it's somebody who has custody of the kids, but uh, the other parent is not paying child support and they need to have, go to a court appearance, but they don't have the capability of attending an online court appearance because they themselves don't have online video capability. All we have to have is a space that can be a kind of refuge, a private safe place for someone to connect to the internet to have video conferencing capability and a few volunteers who might be willing to be trained to help that person be oriented to the equipment. A couple days a week at a time when uh, the daycare does not have parents or kids coming and going and in a place that is not directly affecting the daycare, Swartz Parlor. Wow. There's some resources that we do have, and what a profound difference that could make in the lives of people who wouldn't otherwise be able to have such important and necessary access to what we can give. Another thing, on our front lawn, something that is passed by, by vehicles on the arterial, thousands of them every day, our front lawn, which is a place of uh, great free publicity, we're going to be placing on August 3rd, Tuesday, August 3rd, we're going to be placing 110 light blue flags on our lawn. Why? Because we wanna call attention and raise awareness to the 110 lives lost in Dutchess County last year because of overdose death. We want to break some of the silence that's created by the shame and stigma of substance use disorder to call attention to how this is often kind of a hidden crisis, but is no less a public health crisis than COVID-19. Our lawn not something we typically think of as being a great resource. Being an opportunity to bring the community together for this event on Tuesday, August 3rd at 7 p.m. for people to share some of their stories, to offer opportunities for connection, to provide a message of hope and healing, and to show that we are willing to demonstrate our care for a community that often is pushed into the shadows. Again, doesn't require some huge amount of funding, doesn't require a vast number of volunteers. It simply is taking something we might otherwise forget we even have as a resource and placing it in God's hands and seeing what might result? The key to the story, the miracle of the story, is one that is also tied to what we heard in Ephesians. It's having that sense of being rooted and grounded in God's love and that sense of enoughness that gives us the capacity to feel full of God's goodness and grace, so full that we are more than capable of sharing from that place of fullness and enoughness 
rather from a place of scarcity. Because the wonderful good news, just like that boy had, you know, not that big of a thing to share with 5,000 men, never mind all the women and children like himself, just like that seems kind of small and not enough, he trusted he had something to offer. It's not everything, but when placed in God's hands, it is enough. And just like the overflowing baskets that were filled after everyone was able to eat as much as they want, think about that. That was not a commonplace experience for most people. Just like those overflowing baskets filled with leftovers, Christ is always willing to bless whatever we refuse to hold back. And so, as Reverend Emily Heath says, when we find we don't have to hold on to fear anymore, when, when we realize, when we finally truly believe that we have enough and we are enough, what is it that you are enough of and you have enough of that you could do that could be part of a miracle when that enough is placed in God's hands? How might that be enough to truly bless the world? Let's not forget what we heard in Ephesians that God's power at work in us, in the enough that we have, in the enough that we are, God's power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. So this week, stay rooted and grounded in God's love. Stay connected to that sense that you are enough and you have enough to be part of God's blessing, our hurting, troubled world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, heavens to Betsy. And now as we gather, we have an opportunity to share with one another our joys and concerns, those things which are troubling us and those things which cause us to shout aloud with joy and thanksgiving. We'll have an opportunity to voice those joys and concerns aloud as we pray together. So I invite you now to join with me 
in a spirit of prayer. God of plenty, God of abundance and enough, you satisfy the desires of every living thing. You fill us with all we need. Help us to turn to you, trusting that whatever our struggle may be, whatever our need may be, you will supply, you will fill us, you will give us what we crave, and you will satisfy our desires in a way that is more complete than anything else we might turn to. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, we pray for the family of nations, the families in our communities and our own families, that every person may have all they need to live in peace and to, to not know the struggle of not having enough. We are so keenly aware that there are situations of true scarcity, but that they are driven by our unwillingness to see what resources we have that we have been entrusted with, not to hold on to, but to share. We particularly are mindful of the lack of affordable housing in our downtown Poughkeepsie community. And we pray for our elected leaders and policy makers that we might learn from some of our state neighbors like Connecticut who are requiring that all new housing projects need to include a percentage of those units to be uh, priced at at a rate that people can afford, no more than 30% of someone's income. We pray that indeed you would help us to see what we can do to advocate for finding not only better and more affordable places to live, but for ensuring that everyone has the simple need of a home to be met. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, God, for our fragile planet home and for the ways that too often we are not content with enough. And so we deplete the earth of resources that are meant to be shared, that do not belong to any one group. And we pray that, in fact, you will help us to be part of a community of people who are dedicated to protecting your, your wonderful gift that sustains life for all of us, this our fragile planet home. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, we also pray for victims of war and violence, for all of those who may be seen as the fragments of society, those who are pushed aside, left behind, excluded, and left out. May they be gathered up so that no one is lost, and may we truly be at work to create a society in which all belong and all are cherished. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we pray for those who are in need of healing, those who may need your strength, your courage in times of struggle, your support, your peace which surpasses all understanding. 
We pray for Kathleen G., for Reverend David and his wife Anne, for Sue C.'s father Jerry, and for Sue C., for Daphne's sister Debbie, for Barbara and her sons Todd and David, for Bob M. and Mike S., for Jean B.'s daughter, for Yvonne V. and Bob H. and Judith H. We also pray for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, that you would comfort them in their grief and support them in their struggle. For the family and friends of Chet Burgess, for Dottie M, for Laura, and for others that we may know in our own hearts. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who may be unable to connect with us online, but who are a cherished part of our community. May they know how much we love and care for them and how they are connected to us. For Scott B. and Marion C., for Ha T. and Patty B., for Betty and for Don L. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now, O oh God, we hold up to you our joys and our concerns, our thanksgivings and our cries for help. Gracious, loving, providing God, fill us with your fullness. Help us to trust in you and help us to see how we are enough we have enough to be a part of your miracle of blessing our hurting world. We give you thanks and share our gratitude for the ways that you listen to us, no matter whether we know how to put our prayers into words or not. You hear us and your power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. Thank you. Help us now once again to find renewed inspiration from those powerful words Jesus taught us to pray together. Our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have enough. We are enough. And we each have something that has been distinctly gifted to us to share that will make a difference. Whatever we have sharing, our resources, our time, our energy, our talent, our commitment, and our treasure. When we share that with the ministries of our church together, we can accomplish amazing things and we can be a part of blessing our downtown community and beyond. So whether you are able to uh, send a check to the church office made out to FCC UCC for First Congregational Church of the United Church of Christ, mail it to 269 Mill Street, Poughkeepsie, New York, 12601, or whether you are wanting to go to our website, www dot open to god that's o-p-e-n-t-o-g-o-d dot org and there uh, click on the donation button to be taken to our secure um, uh, web page where you can make a contribution by debit or credit card or whether you choose to make a gift through your online banking um, platform however it is 
that you are able to share, know that what you share is making a difference and is needed and you have enough. And our morning tithes and offerings shall be received as we listen to this beautiful offertory. Ooh. Let's see. Come on. There we go. Um, that Lori is playing. <laughs> you now to join with me in the unison prayer of dedication. Let us pray together. Thank you, God, for all you have given to satisfy our needs. You turn what we perceive as scarcity into plenty and fill our empty hearts with joy and wonder. May our offerings proclaim your abundant goodness and mercy. Bless our gifts that they may become nourishment for all who hunger and refreshment for all who thirst for fullness of life. We pray through the bountiful grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, uh, I have a few announcements for all of you. Um, first of all, big news, next Sunday, August 1st, will be our first Sunday returning to in-person worship in what is probably almost a year and a half since we were last in our sanctuary. And uh, hopefully you all have seen the e-news that uh, has been communicating what some of the special protocols we are putting in place uh, to try to keep people safe and to minimize the risk as much as possible. One thing that has changed since the deacons met last Sunday, uh, changed at church council in light of additional information we have been uh, all getting on the news with the uh, Delta variant, and that is we are going to um, give it a whirl to have absolutely everybody be masked um, and be masked for the whole service. The exception being uh, worship leaders who all must be fully vaccinated 
that when they are on the chancel platform uh, speaking or if they are musicians who are playing, uh, that in that case uh, they can be unmasked for that uh, bit of time. Uh, this is something we're going to try. We don't know if, if it's going to be like absolutely horrendously oppressive. Uh, so we're going to give it a whirl for a couple of Sundays, see how it goes. If it does become extremely difficult for people to feel like they can't even be in a sense of worship, um, then what we may do is have those who have been vaccinated will need to bring their card to show evidence of their vaccination and uh, to them to worship. And then people, uh, once they have been seated, those who have shown evidence of their va vaccination status will be able to remove their mask once seated. But that's, we're, we're holding that in abeyance. We're gonna try with everybody being masked. As it is, when you arrive for worship, those of you who do choose to come, be prepared uh, to go to the portico, the sort of covered entrance to our um, sanctuary building, where there will be a table set up and we will be conducting um, sort of an intake of everybody, getting people's names and phone numbers. Why? Because we need to have that information for contact tracing. Um, and in the case of most of our members, we probably have your phone number, but we'll just confirm that. We'll also take people's temperatures, those who have uh, a temperature uh, reading of 100.4 or greater. Uh, we will ask to uh, go home and take care of themselves. Um, and we will also uh, ensure that everybody um, who enters for worship first needs to either use some hand sanitizer or one of our germicidal uh, wet wipes that we will provide. Um, and then everybody will also exit um, through those front doors at the front of the sanctuary, um, either because people are ready to go home and they're going to go out to the parking lot, or they're going to proceed to head um, through that little hallway uh, that would take you to um, Margaret Chapel, but instead turn into the education wing and go out uh, the, the push bar doors into the back parking lot where we'll have um, uh, some uh, tables and chairs set up for um, outdoor fellowship time with some iced tea and cold water and um, uh, prepackaged individual prepackaged snacks. Next Sunday is Communion Sunday. So just like we have asked all of you on a Communion Sunday when we're all online to have uh, your own communion elements uh, handy for uh, celebrating communion together, we're also going to ask those who come to worship, who know about it, of course, ahead of time, uh, to bring some uh, bread with you uh, to have for communion. And if you also would like to bring some juice of your own or um, we'll have a few extra bottles of water and a few extra zip top bags of individual bags of, of communion bread as well um, for those who forget or those who didn't know they were supposed to bring it. Uh, but uh, that will happen next Sunday. Um, and we don't know if we'll be able to live stream that service. Um, hopefully most of the equipment we need will be arriving and being installed this week um, from Hughes Innovative AV Solutions, but there's a chance that there might be one or two elements that we're still waiting on um, that might make live streaming impossible uh, for that Sunday. But that brings me to saying, hey, we also want some volunteers to help run our live streaming. We've got a few different volunteers who have, have um, uh, stepped forward, but uh, you might be one of them, so if so, please contact me, um, let me know, and we will set up that training with Hughes on how to operate the equipment so we can live stream. We also want to encourage anyone who is concerned about the risks, please, please uh, stay at home and worship with us online. Um, and if that means that you miss out on a service on, on the 1st of August, I am so sorry, um, but you will be able to uh, participate, uh, we hope, on starting August 8th and continuing. Um, in addition to that, you heard me announce the other two ministries we're hoping to be involved in as part of my sermon, uh, not announce so much as describe what's going on. Um, and uh, the uh, special flag um dedication uh, ceremony we'll have in our, our front lawn. We invite members of the public to come to that um, and also yourself and anybody you know that may have been affected um, by either substance abuse disorder, uh, substance use disorder, or um, having lost somebody that they knew uh, to drug overdose. Come be part of that. 
uh, Tuesday, August 3rd at 7 p.m. Wednesday, August 4th, we have been um, advertising this is when we're going to have another meeting, uh, listening session with Reverend Chernell Edney Stilley. That's actually going to happen at 7 p.m., not 6.30 like it's been advertised, 7 p.m. on uh, Wednesday, August 4th. And of course, on Saturday, August 7th, we'll have another Sharing Saturday event at our church uh, between 1 and 3. And um, um, I believe that uh, Denise and Jean will be at the church this Thursday, the 29th, and the following Thursday, which is the 5th, uh, between 1 and 3, to receive your donations to Sharing Saturday. Okay, that was quite a bit. Anybody have any other announcements we want to be sure to, to cover? Reverend Heather? Yes. I'd like to ask Mary Gessick if I could, uh, what is Brian's condition after the motorcycle accident? I um, received an email about it earlier this week. He was in an induced coma. Uh, the situation was quite serious. He had run into a deer. Uh, the damage was extensive, and they really don't know. I'm so sorry, Mary. So I am too. I am too. Definitely praying. Absolutely, Mary. I would like to announce on August 1st also. Um, the town of Poughkeepsie will be sponsoring a reading by um, Paul Oakley Stovall, who's a member of the Hamilton cast at, um, let's see, College Hill Park in Poughkeepsie. He will be reading the Douglas Address at, I believe it's two o'clock. Maybe you know Reverend Heather? Yes, yeah, so this is the person um, who you. played George Washington in um, the Broadway production of the musical Ham Hamilton and who also has a keen interest on his own uh, in Frederick Douglass. And he discovered that Douglass uh, offered an Emancipation Day address at College Hill Park in our own Poughkeepsie. Um, and so there's going to be an event that starts at one, um, is going to feature some gospel singers and some other stuff there, and then he will offer the actual address um, at, at two. Uh, so that's all at College Hill Park, and which is one of the reasons why we're not doing the flag event after worship on Sunday, because we didn't want to steal the thunder from that very nifty event happening in our community. Other announcements? I just wanted to make sure people know it's the city of Poughkeepsie, not the town of Poughkeepsie, where College Hill is. Oh, did I say town of Poughkeepsie? No, I you thought... didn't. Mona did. Oh, okay. Well, it's the city. Okay, no worries. Um, thank you for that clarification. Good to know. Um, you look, well, so you can look that up. If you're looking for it in a town, you won't find it. <laughs> ah, gotcha. Very good. Okay. So uh, everybody can Google map that one if they want to, or however you look up locations, uh, if that's something you're not familiar with. Um, all right, well, uh, any other announcements? And yeah, I'd like to say uh, thank you. This has been really wonderful to be able to uh, worship with everybody here from California. So it's, it's I'll, I'll see you uh, online, but I don't think we'll have the Zoom exchange in, in the community. But when I get back to New York, I'll definitely come and worship with everybody. It's been, it's been great, thank you. Awesome. We, we have loved having you, Mark. That has been a real treat for all of us because, of course, you know, being in a different geographic location, that's not, not normally something that could have happened. So that's a that's an unexpected blessing from COVID-19. Um, and we hope we hope to still be able to do it through Zoom as well as YouTube live. Um, uh, it just may be that you don't we don't have quite as much uh, interaction in quite the same way. Um, that's still to be determined. So again, we hope that grace abounds, but, uh, and that you could still participate in some way, Mark, because, you know, we love it when you read. That's all I'm saying. All right. Well, uh, very good. Uh, I think we're ready for our closing hymn, unless somebody is, you know, waving and saying, please, please, I, I have an announcement. All right. Um, so let's, let's go to that. Our closing hymn, if I could just get my computer to cooperate here, come on, there we go, is Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ. Let's sing it with gusto, everybody. Yeah. 
share God Emmanuel everywhere Jesus lives again Earth can breathe again Pass the word around Loaves open Jesus lives again Earth can breathe again Pass the word around Loaves open Well, thank you to our guest musician, Lori W., who did such a beautiful job uh, with all of our special music and with uh, leading our hymns this morning. Thank you so very much, Lori. And we hope that you received from this service of worship a sense of God's fullness, that you will continue throughout this week to visualize yourself being truly rooted and grounded and God's love and God's sense of having enough and God's fullness so that you may spill over with plenty to share. And may you know that no matter where you go this week, the blessing of the earth maker, the pain bearer and the life giver goes with you today and always. Amen.